Larry, let's talk about the technology itself. Uh, it's, I believe you call it visual presence. And uh, I would love to hear what you have to say about it, uh, is specifically, how the heck does it work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can certainly do that, and I can do it without giving away our secrets too, Scott. No, no, so, yeah, uh, I, I'm not asking you to give away trade secrets, no. <laughs> no, uh, actually, um, we do provide a white paper on our website that uh, will give you a pretty good flavor. It's written very lightly from a marketing standpoint. So uh, if those of you that want to uh, take a deeper dive into the explanation than maybe I'll give right now, you can do so and, and read the story of the genesis of the technology because it's ac actually quite fascinating. But uh, what I usually explain when people ask to understand more about the technology is I say, let's just say that we can break it down into three parts. And um, the first part is that obviously we're starting with a single 2D image. Uh, there's no stereoscopic pair or multiplet to work with. So uh, what we have to do in order to get this disparity information is we have to mathematically synthesize what would the image look like if we saw it from the right and what would the image look like if we saw it from the left. And once we have that information, we have the disparity or the difference between the original image and that outlying right and the outlying left image. We actually use a tri-view approach rather than just a simple stereo view approach. Um, so uh, it's our process, the first piece is akin to kind of a, a 2D to 3D transformation. Um, for a while which, when 3D was- Which is certainly was, possible. A lot of people have done it. Sure. Uh, there are even TVs that came out with uh, 2D to 3D features in them, real-time processing of 2D material to uh, convert it into 3D, and then you could watch with the glasses and, mm -hmm. and uh, have that experience. But uh, we- what we do is we, we need that um, alternate viewpoint information. So in the case of a 2D image, uh, we mathematically synthesize it, uh, obviously very quickly. And uh, then we hand it off to uh, part number two of the technology. And that's the, uh, I mentioned before, defocus and subtract. Now, if you were to, uh, if you were in photography and you heard the term defocus and subtract, you would know that that equates to unsharp mask. And uh, in enhancement, uh, unsharp mask is, is, a, is a filter that uh, brings out uh, high frequency information in the image, making it uh, appear more clear. Uh, for our purposes, uh, for the fact that it's essentially an unsharp mask, um, only quite different, uh, is important. The reason that it's different is because with an unsharp mask, you're defocusing and subtracting an image from itself. With our process, you're defocusing and subtracting an image from an alternate view of the same scene as the original image. Ah, so, so, so in other words, you're taking the, the synthesized alternate view or um, uh, disparity information and defocusing and subtracting that. Right. And so when you use that fact that it's an it's a it's a different image than the source image it's not the same as an unsharp mask and what it avails itself of is uh, the ability to use that information to then modulate simply the luminance of each pixel and that is all we do is make a pixel one by one each pixel either brighter or dimmer or do nothing and that process of pixel by pixel uh, modulating the brightness and the dimness of the pixel, um, you know, for HD is done at 165 million times per second, uh, but it's governed by the third part of our technology. And I should say this is probably the, uh, you know, by the largest part of our technology is what we call the perceptor. Now, the perceptor is uh, in image science terms called uh, a saliency mask or map. And what that is, is it's a way of assessing the content of an image and then making decisions based upon the segmentation of the image. So we're scanning the image very, very, very fast and making real-time decisions as to what to do to each pixel based upon what our saliency map tells us is interesting in the picture to pop and what's not interesting in the picture and uh, therefore, we can in real time differentiate 
where somebody's face is, uh, what the object of interest is, versus something that you wouldn't be paying attention to in the image, like the plain blue sky behind the actor or uh, a flat wall that uh, doesn't need any enhancement. So those well, are the this, three this, parts. This, this, sounds, this last part sounds a little bit like artificial intelligence. I mean, how would the processor know what's important to look at and what's not important to look at? Well, it or what, absolutely or what is. what the eye would, yeah, what, what would the eye be drawn to naturally versus not? I suppose with the sky, you've got a big, flat, more or less flat area, and so the processor would probably say, oh, that's probably not that important. Well, it is artificial intelligence because uh, back in the days that it was a piece of software, we could steer that with knobs and dials and sliders and, and uh, little controls because we were doing the process uh, grossly out of real time, you know, something like an HD frame uh, every two seconds. But mm. uh, in today's modern video days, we need to be able to uh, operate uh, independent of human interaction and the AI that's built into our perceptor um, is very, very important to the extent that we actually couldn't produce a commercially viable image with the entire process if we didn't have the perceptor. Uh, it's, it's probably 80 to 90 percent of, of uh, what makes our solution successful. Because mm. I was going to ask, when you were talking about defocus and um, subtract or, or unsharp mask, uh, sharpening things, of course, the, the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, well, what about if you if you artificially sharpen an image, you very often get things like ringing and additional noise and all kinds of problems. So I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the, what this perceptor then does is to apply the processing more to things that are important, quote unquote, and less to things that aren't important, which would help alleviate the problem of of over sharpening, edge enhancement, ringing, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Scott. And that's one of the reasons that we've gotten the accolades that we have. You know, you have things like sharpening and color boosting in your TV, um, and you can turn those knobs up and down uh, <laughs> and and do those enhancements already. And uh, I you, just just FYI, uh, I normally recommend for people who buy a new TV and the five basic parameters, the controls that people can control are um, brightness, contrast, color, tint, and sharpness. And normally I say you want to turn sharpness basically all the way down, possibly to, to one or two clicks above zero, because in some cases turning it all the way down will really soften the image. But you really don't want that sharpness control up very high at all because of these problems that can occur. That's true. And uh, it's amazing how, as you say, on a TV, you can try that experiment. You know, can you turn up the sharpness and get to the point where you see some edge ringing, turn it down slightly so there isn't any? In general, uh, that's going to be a fairly low setting. Mm -hmm. Now, the calibrators who, uh, you know, really challenged us in the beginning when we uh, brought our product and technology to market because they thought that, um, okay, if you add processing, Darby processing is just going to create artifacts. But uh, lo and behold, because of the internal workings of our, our um, image processing pipeline, because of our perceptor, uh, they discovered that you can get uh, that, that calibrated image, you can uh, set that up as, as, as tuned as you want to, and then add our processing to the video chain, and lo and behold, you don't produce uh, artifacts like edge ringing and uh, halos and uh, enhance mm -hmm. the noise, uh, which would be so common if we were doing some naive additional filtering.